Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. And my guest today is Rebecca Giblin, a ARC Future Fellow and Associate Professor at Monash's University's Law Faculty in Australia. Rebecca's scholarship focuses on copyright policy and authorship, and we're going to discuss her new paper, A New Copyright Bargain, Reclaiming Lost Culture and Getting Authors Paid, which was recently published by the Columbia Journal of Law and the Arts. So uh, re- re- welcome, Rebecca, to the podcast. Very happy to be talking to you. Excellent. So I got to say, like all your work, I really enjoyed reading this paper, and I especially enjoyed it because I felt like it was such a nice bookend to your well, bookend to your recent book with Kimberly Weatherly, um, uh, How Should We Reimagine Copyright? And I was wondering if you could kind of, by way of prefacing the paper, kind of give listeners an idea of what you and Kimberly were trying to do in the book, and then maybe we can transition into how the paper relates to the book. Because I think that'd be helpful for people in understanding sort of where you're coming from and, and what your project is like. Yeah, sure. So it's uh, Kim Weatherall was the current editor and we had a bunch of contributors from around the world. And what I wanted to do with that project is I wanted to write a fairy tale because we have so many times where we're talking about copyright reform and all of the good ideas, it sometimes feels like all of the good ideas are blocked by that planetive refrain that the treaties won't let us do that. And Obviously, if we were to start out from scratch and draw up a copyright law today with what we know about how and why people create uh, with the modern communication technologies, it would look very differently to the one that we have. And so what I wanted to do is challenge my collaborators to go out and think about what copyright would look like if we drew it up from scratch today. If we didn't have to worry about the political realities or the treaties, uh, or the political will involved in achieving meaningful change. We started with a blank slate, what would that look like? Now, that might sound like a really indulgent project, but what I was coming from was Thomas Kuhn's idea about paradigm shift and the conditions that you need for a scientific revolution. Now, uh, when he set out that theory, and created this notion of paradigm shift for the first time, he said that in order to move from one scientific paradigm to another, you need to have uh, an explanation, an alternative explanation, that does a better job of explaining the challenges than the one that you've got now. So uh, to move from Ptolemaic astronomy to Copernican astronomy, we needed Copernicus to come along and say, well, maybe, maybe the explanation is that we don't have this little loop-de-loop around Mars. Um, and in fact, <laughs> the, um, uh, the sun works a different way to what we've posited before. And once we had that alternative, then we had the conditions for that paradigm shift where we moved from the Ptolemaic ideas to the Copernican. And so what I wanted to do is put forward some ideas about what an alternative paradigm in copyright could look like if we weren't bound by all of the stuff that we're bound by. Yeah, yeah, sort of get rid of all the epicycles and and see where we end up there. And what I really love about the project is it it just seems so optimistic, right? Because so sort of the I, I feel like the fallback in a lot of American copyright scholarship in particular, but IP scholarship in general, is this sort of Fritz Machlup observation that, you know, sort of, you know, if if we hadn't created patent and copyright, it would be it would be a bad idea to create it. But now that we've got it, it's a bad idea to get rid of it. And your project just seems so much more kind of optimistic and forward thinking about, you know, we can do better because we know more and things have changed and we can adapt. Like in theory, we could we could adapt what we know to the new world that that we're actually experiencing. And one of the things I loved about the new paper was you sort of took those optimistic ideas and and really tried to make them I tried to make them real. And I was wondering if you could talk about like the shift from the book project 
to the paper and, and how you saw the difference between the two. Yeah, so uh, that's exactly right. Um, I, would, I would say that what if we could reimagine copyright didn't end on a particularly um, optimistic note because we uh, really do that deep analysis about what would be involved in changing the treaties. And we conclude that it's basically impossible. We haven't had a substantive revision to burn in almost half a century, and it looks, uh, the chances of it happening are vanishingly unlikely. A little bit more likely, perhaps, since we finished the book, because now President Trump's come along, uh, <laughs> uh, working pretty differently with the WTO. Maybe it's not so unthinkable to see a universe where the WTO doesn't exist exist anymore, in which case all bets are off. Right. But um, for the foreseeable future, this is, this is what we're stuck with. And so that took me to, so, so while I said it might sound like an engagement project, it ended up being extremely pragmatic and useful because in thinking about what we would do if we started from scratch, I came up with a lot of ideas about things that would actually be possible now. And that's where this paper came in from. And in fact, it's part of a bigger grant project um, that I created inspired by where we got to with the book. And the idea is, okay, so if we've got these immovable treaties, but we know that at the moment, copyright's doing a really poor job of achieving all of its core, main, core aims. It's doing a poor job of, um, you know, it's doing an absolutely fine job of incentivizing the creation of work. We've got more than ample incentives, but we don't incentivize works, uh, the creation of works as an aim in and of itself. We do it so that society can benefit from widespread access to knowledge and culture. And copyright's actually doing a pretty poor job of achieving that. It's locking up a lot of works uh, that, that um, are not being commercially exploited. We've got huge problems with orphaning. Um, we've got, you know, uh, unworkable systems and huge transaction costs. Mm. And at the same time, it's doing a really poor job of achieving its other name, uh, other aim, which is recognising and rewarding creators. And so if we start from scratch and we say, well, if we want to do a better job of achieving those aims, then what are the flexibilities left to us within the structure of the main treaties, burn and trips, um, that might enable us to do a better job? And so that's where it came from. And so the process of writing this paper, I, I was incredibly privileged to have this opportunity because I'd been wanting to write the paper for a long time. Um, and Jane Ginsburg and June Bessick and I decided to run uh, the Kennekin Center annual colloquium on this topic of the, the flexibilities in Vernon trips last year. And so I went to New York and we tied it in with a time that Sam Ricketson was also going to be in New York to work with Jane on the third edition of their incredible Burn Treatise. And so what I had was a two or three week period where I was uh, working with Jane and Sam and I would just wander into their offices, you know, probably every day, sometimes two or three times a day. And I would say, what about this? Because what I was doing is I was thinking about I wanted to get from A to B and I had to go through this thicket um, and I would go to them and, and this is really I think with the cheats way of doing this because they have such incredible encyclopedic knowledge of burn and its history and they remember everything from every little side document or at least it seems that way to me and they can just pull it out of their minds so directly. So I came in with all the heretical ideas about how to do it, and they kept telling me, no, that, that won't be committed, that won't be committed. And kind of together, we wriggled our way through all of the obstacles. Um, and I did eventually uh, navigate a pathway uh, through Burn and Trips that passes the Jane and Sam test about what would be permitted. Um, and that does, I think, uh, have a lot of potential for doing a better job of reclaiming that currently lost culture and also getting authors a fairer share of copyright rewards. Yeah, and it's also like incredibly clever. Um, so maybe, I mean, so this is one of the things, one of the several things I loved about the paper, but maybe you could, you could share with people sort of this clever, really brilliant observation you made about what burn-in trips require and how countries could 
still unilaterally make changes that would enable them to improve copyright law. Okay. Well, well, first of all, and this does build on my previous work um, in Code Wars and uh, a bunch of other papers, that copyright law is very much based on these outdated assumptions and lots of them no longer hold true in the current context. And once we recognize that, then we can start to think differently about what a law might look like. Um, so maybe I could start with just briefly outlining you know, those assumptions that I think no longer hold good, but that are, um, you know, that the law is basically um, based on. So I would say that there's a whole bunch of them. Um, one of them is that there's no downside to the grant of terms that are almost certainly going to outlast their owner's interest because most works will be quickly lost anyway. And I think the, the best example of that line of thinking comes from um, the congressional testimony of Mark Twain, Samuel Clement, Clemens, back in 1906. Um, he came before the US Congress to argue for longer terms. And he didn't base his argument on the value of books, but on their complete and utter lack of value. Right? He said, well, only one book in a thousand can outlive the existing limit of 42 years. And what happens is when those copyrights expire, the books that are still valuable continue to be published and the value valueless books continue not to be published. And the only difference is in whether publishers are obliged to continue sharing their profits with authors or not. Mm. Right. So what what uh, Clemens was arguing is that well, lawmakers might as well grant long terms to every single work because that's going to enable authors to share in the benefits of the few that have lasting value and the rest are going to be lost to obscurity anyway and he was absolutely right when he when he said that we did very quickly lose almost all books right but obviously that's something that has changed now right that no longer has to be the case um, another failed assumption I think was the idea that if copyright is granted access will follow and we can see you know, whatever was the case before um, in, in the pre-digital paradigm, uh, we can see from the scale of the orphan works problems and availability problems now that we can't rely on that to happen anymore, mm. right? So uh, just because somebody holds the exclusive rights in a work doesn't mean that they will make it available. Um, and another assumption that I think is a fair assumption is that copyright will get authors paid. And this one's a bit different. In, I would argue perhaps it's never really held good. Mm. Um, I, I go back to some uh, draft legislation from 1737, which uh, it was just after the Statute of Anne in the UK, mm. and they were already arguing for protection for authors because they're being unfairly divested of their rights before anyone knows what they're worth. So it's really the same, one of the same difficulties that we have now. Um, but I think that there has been an assumption that if we give copyright, it will lead to authors getting fairly paid. And what we're seeing now is that that assumption has really failed. Uh, the book industry, for example, um, it's actually doing better than it ever has before. Um, but the share that most authors has gone down dramatically. Mm. Uh, and we, he we, we hear some of the, the, the big five publishers, Simon & Schuster, uh, Penguin Random House, they're reporting profits around 16% which is massive, but the, the amount of money actually earned by authors is just in precipitous decline. Mm. And so uh, a couple of other assumptions as well, we've got the assumption that registration is costly and onerous to authors, right? Absolutely true in 1908 when the Berlin Act of Bern prohibited formalities on the exercise and enjoyment of rights. I would say maybe most people agreed with this still in 1994 when, when TRIPS was agreed and we still had less than half a percent of the world's population with access to the internet. Um, but if today, of course, registration is so cheap and, and so quick, at least in developed countries, that it's just an unremarked feature of daily life. Mm -hmm. And the last assumption that I'll mention that, that was really core to this is this idea that departing from Burns Minima is definitionally worse for authors. Now, this is one that I argue with Jane about a lot. It's always assumed that a country, so, so countries 
can depart from burn for their own domestic works. Mm -hmm. And it's always assumed that, of course, they wouldn't do that because that definitionally means treating their own authors worse than they're treating international authors, and the optics of that are terrible. But um, my idea, or one of my ideas, was that actually uh, we've reached a point, I think, where the costs and benefits of copyright have changed so much, uh, particularly with the potential for formalities to actually help authors um, get a, a bigger share of their copyright or retain a bigger share of their copyright, that perhaps we've reached the point where judicious use of things like registration um, would actually benefit rather than harm authors. And so I wanted to also challenge the orthodoxy that domestic burn departure is necessarily um, bad for domestic authors. Yeah, and so, it was that last one that really got me, right? Mm -hmm. like, had never occurred to me before. And I just found that incredibly clever, the idea that even though we've got these international treaties limiting what we can do with international works, there may be ways we can actually improve domestic copyright by you know, doing something that would appear to limit the rights of domestic copyright owners, but actually better achieve the goals of domestic copyright policy and that just was like totally something that hadn't occurred to me before and really i think uh, an important observation it's really one of the ideas that excites me as well um, and what i do in the paper is i draw up this alternative bargain about what an, a scheme that better achieved its aims look like and then i talk about something um, that i call the front door out so we, um, Bern does prevent countries from entering into any treaty um, that would derogate from Bern, but there is nothing at all that would stop countries from getting together and uh, all agreeing to each regulate their own nationals in a harmonized and cooperative way that happens to involve elements of domestic departure from Bern. Mm. And so we actually have the potential here, like if a few significant copyright producing countries were to take this front door out together and each implement an alternative copyright bargain of the kind that I described in the paper, then we could have a really dramatic impact. Um, and significantly when, when it comes to the, the type of domestic registration that I've described, we could have countries each share their domestic registries and create a comprehensive treaty compatible ownership database. Um, I'm really interested as well in thinking about how we rearrange copyright to reduce some of the monopolistic effects that have been um, the result of current approaches. Because of course what happens when, when rights last for the author's lifetime plus 70 years and there's nothing to stop uh, a cultural investor from taking those rights for the entire period. Um, we end up with a concentration of rights in the hands of an uh, increasingly smaller number of companies uh, and it makes it really difficult for new uh, providers to enter the market. So Spotify is a great example of course. Um, they, they came along with a really smart different idea about the way music could be distributed but in order to get anyone to listen to Spotify, they needed to have the songs that people wanted to listen to on it. Those catalogs were controlled by a handful of companies. Like, um, a lot of that music was hand, uh, just in, in the hands of a very small number of companies. And the cost of Spotify getting access to that was that they had to transfer a big chunk of, of themselves to those companies in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I think it would look really, really different if we were to have a system whereby rights were freed up much more regularly. We could break some of those monopoly effects and that's inevitably going to improve the situation for creators because one of the huge difficulties they face at the moment is that there's many sellers and increasingly small pool of buyers. Yeah, so yeah. If we're well, gonna have yeah. yeah, and and in what I really loved about that part of your argument was where you took a frankly like neglected or ignored part 
of American copyright doctrine, namely the renewal and termination doctrine, and sort of recast it in a way that made me really look at it very differently and think about its purposes and what it could accomplish in a way that I hadn't previously. And I was wondering if you could talk about sort of how the concept of termination and reversion of rights works into your, your kind of perspective on how to make copyright work better. Yeah, so I think that uh, there are, I think that a lot of people, when they think about termination or reversion, they automatically think about the US framework and then they dismiss it. They're like, oh, that's, that's, that's rubbish. It doesn't work. It's too onerous. It's too expensive. There's too many hoops that you've got to jump through. Right? But I think while I agree with those criticisms of the US system, I think that we should absolutely not dismiss the potential for reversion or termination to fix a lot of the problems that we've got now. There's a couple of reasons for that. And up front and center is that burn and trips regulate a lot of things about copyright, but they don't have a word to say about ownership. Mm. And so ownership of rights is one of the huge flexibilities that we have to affect meaningful change. And so let me let me let me talk a little bit about the framework that I used, which sure. which did come out of the Reimagine Copyright book, um, to explain how how I got to this point where I think as well that that uh, reversion is so significant. So when we boil it right down, copyright is about incentives and rewards. We want to incentivize the creation of works, as I say, in order to um, enable society to benefit from access to knowledge and culture. That means incentivize works being made continually available. Um, and then on top of that, there's another thing, which is that we want to reward, recognize and reward authors. Now, Americans will often tell me, no, 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 uh, copyright is only utilitarian. It's only about incentives, okay? But if copyright was only about incentives, it would only last for a maximum of about 25 years, right? Incentivizing the creation um, and ongoing distribution of material, we've, that's a purely economic aim. We've got all the economic analyses, um, and we see that 25 years is the outside to which that can really be justified. So in addition to that, um, people like John Ginsburg um, and Martin Senfleben have done the work to show that there are very often more naturalist considerations that come into play, even in US statute and US uh, uh, precedents that can only be explained you know, sorry, that can only really be explained on naturalist justification. So there is also this desire to, to reward authors. But if we separate these things out, it gives us a really important insight because if we can only, ins if, we, if incentives only justify about 25 years of protection, then everything after that can only be justifiable as being a reward for, for the author. Now, um, now we start to think about how reversion comes in and about how that, that burn and tricks flexibility becomes relevant mm -hmm. because Let's think about what would happen if we were to revert works back to authors after at an outside 25 years of protection. That would mean that they would have an opportunity to either contract again with the, the same party that they did previously, or they could contract with somebody else. Um, it would open up opportunities for new players to enter the market. Um, and capture some of those back catalogs in order to open up um, new opportunities for authors and introduce a greater number of buyers into the market. It would also open, open up opportunities for uh, greater direct licensing that wasn't possible you know, and before uh, digital, but is now. Yeah. And one of the examples that I use um, comes from another project I'm running, which is uh, an international investigation into uh, e-books or e-lending in public libraries around the world. And we've looked at almost 100,000 books across five countries. And what we found is that publishers are making older books available, but very often on terms that make it infeasible for libraries to add them to their collections. So for example, it might be a 40-year-old Pulitzer Prize winner it's for sale for two or three times the paperback price. 
and it's on a license. Um, we call it an excluding license. So it will be deleted from the library's collection in one or two years, even if nobody ever borrows it, right? And then we know that books depreciate quickly. A book like that is gonna have much less demand than the latest Lee Child, for example. Mm. And libraries deciding how to spend their scarce collections budgets will have to buy the Lee Child instead. Now, if we were to have, for example, reversion to authors after 25 years, um, which as I say is justified if we separate out these incentives and rewards rationales, authors would be, it, markets would open to enable authors to license those books directly into public libraries. For example, uh, in exchange for her loan remuneration. And those little bits of revenue might not be particularly interesting to publishers, but they could well make a significant difference to authors. Um, yeah. even, even if you're only talking a couple of hundred loans per year across the country. Yeah, no, and, so, that's, and that's really interesting, like the idea that you might actually improve the efficiency of the distribution part of the incentive puzzle, as it were, by disaggregating ownership rather than keeping it as aggregated as it currently is, is like, I, I mean, not obvious, but intuitively quite compelling once you point out the incentives of the sort of big institutional copyright owners. Mm. And I think it's really important as well for actually moving copyright debates forward because I was, look, I, this, uh, as I said, it's part of a big grant application and I actually, I rage wrote the application for this grant because I was so tired of having the same arguments over and over and over again and never moving forward. Mm. And the arguments are based on this false dichotomy. It's authors versus users, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's never been what it's about. Mm. And what I wanted to do is separate out these interests. Authors are continually used as stalking horses to protect other people's economic interests. And I wanted to separate out the rights of authors from the rights of owners. And my, my argument for the project was, I think if we were to actually take authors' interests seriously, we could do a great deal not only to help get them better paid, but also to reclaim that culture that's lost under current approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's really true. And it's like one of the things that I really like about both this paper and a lot of your previous work is that, you know, you find a lot of common normative ground that I think is often lost between people who conceptualize themselves as consequentialists or, you know, moral rights theorists, deontologists, mm -hmm. when it comes to copyright, to, to, to copyright ownership and copyright mm -hmm. use and copyright policy and sort of point out that a lot of these are, are really, I think, policy questions about, you know, how we're gonna achieve goals while also achieving normative results that we think are positive at the same time. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's really dangerous. This, this framing of the debate is you're, you're pro-copyright or anti-copyright, you're copyright maximalist or you're copyright minimalist. I don't care about more or less, I care about how well it achieves its aims and with how much collateral damage. Mm. And I think that once you take a step back, so that it's a really basic question, but what do we want to achieve? How well are we doing it now? How can we do it better within the constraints that we've got? It opens up new ways of thinking that can actually move us forward instead of being stuck in this endless loop. Mm. Mm, yeah, I think that's, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with that more, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to throw some at you now that's maybe a, a little bit different from the topic of your book and your paper, but I'm really interested to, to hear your thoughts about it. So, I mean, I, in some ways, I still feel like there's a strong consequentialist element, even even though the normative element is strong in a lot of your work, that it's still really about compensating artists and compensating authors and, you know, making sure that we maintain access while we do that. Um, I, I, I wonder what you think about the sort of moral 
rights arguments and how you see them in relation to the kinds of positions you're taking in this paper and in your book and in your work more generally. So can I just clarify, do you mean um, moral rights or kind of naturalist justifications for copyright? I mean, I mean moral rights in terms of people being able to assert sort of non-economic in, mm -hmm. in controlling how other people use works that they've created. Mm -hmm. Look, I think that there's a really important place for that. I would probably argue that uh, France has taken it a bit too far. So moral rights in France, of course, are perpetual. They don't expire at the end of the copyright term. Uh, Australia, I think, could probably go a little bit further. We introduced uh, moral rights um, I don't know, a little over 10 years ago uh, now. And... Um, they, I think that they're, they're probably insufficient. It's made very little difference to practice in Australia. The film industry in particular was uh, able to carve out an awful lot of exemptions for them. Um, I think they have an important role, but I think in addition to that, we need, I, I, I think often, you know, there's these, there's these discussions, you know, the, the author's moral rights and maybe not enough consideration of the, the author's economic rights to actually get money ending up in their pockets. Mm. I think that for all of the rhetoric about authors and putting them at the forefront of all copyright debates, um, it's really on the theory of trickle-down economics. You know, it's, it's the, the theory of the sparrows and the birds. If you, uh, sorry, if, it's the theory of the, the sparrows and the horses. If you feed the, bird, uh, the horses enough oats, then some will trickle down and feed the birds. Um, but... <laughs> what we've got actually um, and so that's exactly what is happening in copyright you know uh and a, a book author might be earning as little as three or five cents with some of the for, for, for a sale of a copy um using some of these high discount clauses that we're seeing uh, very much in the modern book industry um and when we have publishers coming out and using authors to argue for uh, uh longer copyrights uh fewer exceptions broader rights um, they're really asking for greater protection for them uh, and just very little, uh, very few oats trickling through to those birds. So we've got fat horses and starving sparrows. Um, and I think it's important not just to, um, absolutely non-economic rights are important, but I also want to hear people talking about economic rights for authors as opposed to owners. Right, right. Because at the moment, if you look at it, if you look at the salaries um, and the drops, there's uh, data, they've got really good longitudinal data out of the UK where they've been tracking this for a while. And the proportion of authors that can make a living from full-time writing has fallen just absolutely through the floor since um, 2005 when they started tracking this. Uh, and we also see that the backup jobs, the additional jobs for writers that did actually use to pay in journalism, for example, just don't exist anymore. Um, so these questions are really important and urgent now. Yeah, well, and, and one of the things I really liked about your observations on that front is that your sort of discussion of how to rethink copyright policy and the distribution of rights in different circumstances didn't only focus on distributional questions or kind of normative questions about who should internalize the positive externalities, but also about efficiencies, right? I mean, and that was what really made it even more compelling for me. It wasn't just about who deserves to get the rights, but why shifting who holds the rights can actually make the policy itself more efficient from a public perspective. Oh, absolutely. The way we do it now is extremely inefficient, extremely wasteful, has a huge amount of collateral damage. Um, and so thinking about, th that's why I think that separating out our aims and thinking about how we want to achieve all of them in a better way um, does unlock that kind of thinking where you're solving a lot of problems at the same time. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Rebecca, it's been such a pleasure talking to you about your paper and about your work more generally. I hope we can do another uh, podcast again soon. 
and I was just wondering if you had, you know, any thoughts or any kind of final observations you wanted to leave people with. Uh, look, I think that these, these questions are not going away. They're becoming ever more urgent. It was just a week or two um, since Canada, that long time holdout, was reluctantly obliged to sign up to Life Plus 70 as a condition of continuing the free trade agreement with the US and Mexico. Um, and I think that there are opportunities now uh, as these events are transpiring to to already ask these questions. Okay, so rights have got to last for life plus 70 for really practical reasons, but how should they be divided up and what's the best way of doing that to achieve our aims? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, and uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. Great, thank you so much. Okay.